Welcome again to What I Did Next from ANT Media. I'm Malak Fuad. I welcome a new guest from the region on each episode, and we take a deep dive into their lives' most pivotal moments. On today's episode, fashion and branding entrepreneur Hatem El Hakil tells me why his mission to showcase the best of his native Saudi Arabia is so important to him. How are we even going to have our own identity if our heritage and our culture is not ingrained in what we create? For people to give us attention, for people to, to start respecting us, they have to realize that we're gonna, we have our own stories and our own stories have to be reflected in our work. Western culture has, been, has, has really kind of inspired me over the years. I've learned a lot and I'm grateful to Western culture. But now it's time to also focus on our own culture and our identity. And I believe that this is also what Saudi Arabia is doing, tapping into what is their identity and taking it further. Hatem El Hakil is an award-winning designer, entrepreneur, and podcast host. He has designed for global icons, including Mattel's Barbie, Evian, Lexus, Fairmont, Raffles, and the Ritz-Carlton, among others. And he was among the first regional artists to create and celebrate Saudi traditions. His first company, Tobi Hatem El Hakil, brought the traditional Tobi into the luxury fashion world, with displays at Harvey Nichols, Saks Fifth Avenue, and Boutique One. Today, Hatem runs Authenticité, a consulting and creative production agency connecting creators and brands who want to better understand Saudi culture. He also continues developing content with his editorial pieces, showcasing Saudi artists on his website and through his podcast, Gems of Arabia. Hatem and I are the same age and grew up with similar points of reference. He's an incredibly easy person to interview and talk to. As a de facto ambassador for Brand Saudi Arabia, he brings humor and the perfect blend of East meets West to the table. Being able to explain the other and be at ease in different cultures is something he and I have in common and perhaps take for granted. However, it's a major asset and he wears it lightly and elegantly. Hatim grew up in Saudi Arabia and in the US and went to boarding school in Switzerland before attending Boston University. Many elements towards uh, how much I benefited from being in boarding school in Switzerland. One of them was the fact that I was exposed to so many cultures with people from all over the world, whether it's Australia, whether it's Mombasa, whether it's Europe, whether it's States. So being exposed to such a diverse community from a very young age made me uh, much more open-minded and much more exposed to uh, different mentalities, different cultures. Uh, I'm very grateful for that, actually. And I think when you were in Boston, there at the time, there was a huge Arab community there, even now, actually. Um, did you find yourself uh, becoming friends more with the Arabs or did you try and uh, meet other people or, or how did it go for you? I mean, for me, it was all of, always about diversity. Uh, yes, there were, there were Saudis. Yes, there were Egyptians. Yes, there were Lebanese. But there, was, there were also, you know, uh, um, Italians. There were Kuwaitis. There were um, French uh, so uh, I always kind of like to have that kind of exposure. Yeah, I've been bridging uh, cultures. I think since since day one, I was always kind of like yeah. felt like like an ambassador to to Saudi. I always wanted to kind of represent my Saudi uh, in a certain way. Ever since I was I was a kid. That's interesting. I, I, I'm very similar because I I lived in many different countries and. I, I find that you're always explaining one part of yourself or one part of your culture to whoever you're sitting with. And it it can be fun, but it can also be a little bit um, isolating, maybe. I don't know. It can be a bit frustrating where people are undermining you. Uh, oh, my God, really? You're from there? But okay, why? No, there's so many... Diverse uh, cultured people uh, from all over the world. You know, I don't know why there, yeah. there's a specific stereotype that has to exist when you, when you are from a certain region. And I always felt like it was kind of my role to change perception um, through my fashion, through my work, through everything that I ended up doing. It, it became almost like a mission uh, for me to show what we're about as as, as Arabs. Yeah. You know, I think it, yeah. I think we all have a responsibility to do that, especially when our parents made the effort to. Uh, and the investment and the you know the ethos of of making sure that we have that kind of bridging uh, perspective. It's it's our duty to uh, to represent. I think. I think also that there is now a receptiveness in Western countries to hear the story. You know, they realize that there's diversity, there is uh, sophistication, and we're not lumped in. We're not all lumped into one one bucket where what's happening in Morocco is different to what's happening in the UAE, is different to Oman, is different to Syria. We were all just one before, and clearly that's now changing. And 
and that can only be a good thing. It was all either, you know, uh, basically um, Alibaba and 1000 Nights, or that, that's pretty much how they see us, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah. Or, or terrorists. Or terrorists, yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. and unfortunately, you know, there's a lot of lack of knowledge on, on Arabia, lack of, uh, lack of knowledge on our, on our part of the world. And now people have no choice because they have been so affected by the lack of humanity. They want to learn more about what's happening. I think it just uh, reiterates the fact that uh, we are all, uh, we're all one in the end. You know, uh, yeah, we're all yeah. humans, and the fact that certain people don't understand uh, what is happening is is baffling to me. Baffling. Yeah. You know? And uh, I think it's 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 uh, it's high time that uh, pe- more light is shed on on us as as an Arab community and and our capabilities, our passions, and uh, what we are going through as well. So you did something very exciting and fun as a student. You became a model. <laughs> yes. So you went to New York while you were studying in Boston yeah. and you signed up with an agency and you did modeling on the side. Yeah, well, it wasn't something that I kind of, uh, you know, pursued, but it kind of came, f- fell into my plate. And I thought, you know, why not? It was giving me the opportunity to go and visit New York. I love New York. New York was such a, such a diverse uh, cosmopolitan place. Very different than anywhere else in, in the U.S. Um, you know, Anna Wintour used to say, you want to see what is next year's fashion? Go to the meatpacking district and you will, you will see what the trends are. And I love the sense of individuality that people had. That even uh, besides fashion, just culturally, they were much more in tune with what's happening in the world. But everyone had their own take. Everyone had their own perspective. It's very much the melting pot because every nationality is there. Absolutely. Very cosmopolitan, yeah. very diverse. And I was lucky enough to, uh, you know, walk for Armani, Jill Sander, uh, and various designers. And from there, I really became bitten by the fashion bug. And I'm like, wait a minute. Wow. Why am I not studying fashion? What am I doing? This is, <laughs> <laughs> this is a world that I really love. And I tried to find the formula uh, all throughout my, my early career before I became a designer to find the formula. Of how can I work in fashion? And why didn't I study it? Uh, but then I realized that, you know, wait a minute, you don't really have to study everything that you're passionate about. But uh, it was actually a, a turning point for me that made me realize that you can multitask. Uh, and you can pursue uh, different things while you're still focusing on one thing. So graduated, wanted to stay a little bit longer and do more modeling, but the family was like, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> There's only so much they'll accept, right? Yeah, exactly. So much they'll accept. Uh, and it was, the kind of, it was a blessing in disguise that uh, put me in, in a position where I had to go back and, and make something of myself. So I worked in, uh, in marketing, I worked in advertising, I worked in banking. But when I worked in banking, I realized, okay, this is not for me. I was never really part of the corporate environment. I could never really fit into the corporate world. It was not my, my, I didn't feel it was my calling and it didn't match my ethos of wanting to create, wanting to become an individual. So I went to London and uh, went to Savile Row and then a light bulb came out. Um, While I was going to London, I realized that, wait a minute, why don't we bring a bit of Savile Row into tradition? So I saw that the Tobe market was still kind of limited when it comes to execution, when it comes to uh, quality. So I went back to Saudi. At that time, I was at the bank. And at the bank, uh, you had to wear a suit every day or you wear a Tobe. And I had to wear a Tobe every day. And I'm, I'm like, I'm not about to wear the same thing every day. Like, I refused. <laughs> so I found, yeah. I found some great tailors. Um, and uh, my parents, my mother was nice enough to let me uh, use uh, the house where I could get a tailor and have some machines to come in and actually make some proper bespoke uh, tobes through social, through uh, Google, through uh, tutorials, through uh, trial and error. We cr- crafted and created really immaculately made tobes. So are you self-taught? I'm self-taught, yes. And did you actually sew yourself? I mean, did you say, I want this cut like this? I want to do it like this. I mean, did you get really involved in how you wanted your tobes to look? I never studied pattern making. I never studied uh, stitching, but I found some great tailors and I, I know, understood what quality was. So we always love fashion. You know, there's something that my mom Hama, always gave us, you know, uh, understanding quality, understanding fashion. So I had some really beautiful shirts that were, that were made immaculately. And I said, why can't we translate this? Brought those as examples, as prototypes. And from there, we started to create the execution. Proud to say that we brought the some quality into the tobe making, you know, uh, f- well-finished uh, colors, detailing. Uh, obviously, I took it the next level where I made them very avant-garde. They, they do look different. They don't look, obviously, not at all like the traditional. Thank you. And there's an edge to them. They're, they're, they're really funky. Thanks they're really a lot. Cool. 
ever since, even since boarding school days, I always wanted to show that our culture and our heritage can hold its own with international. I want to know how your family reacted when you left the banking world and the more corporate, traditional, conventional world behind and you said you know fashion is where my heart is this is what i want to do and obviously you were you were a pioneer uh not just maybe for your family not in your family only but obviously within your uh your larger peer group i'm sure <laughs> how was that honestly uh i'm very lucky because uh my mother Allah and uh, my brother were always very supportive in all the decisions that i make you know uh, I, they, i always went by the beat of my own drum Uh, and I was always very stubborn, so there wasn't any <laughs> any kind of... They had no choice. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't really have any choice, no. Uh, but, uh, I mean, it was... Uh, they saw that I had a vision, and they saw that uh, my approach was very different, and they saw that there was a niche for it in the market. So it made sense. You know, there there was an actual business plan. Uh, not the business plan that that maybe I should have really focused on, but there was there was a vision. Uh, and from there, they just kind of uh, realized that, you know, I'm onto something and this is my calling. And I've always wanted to work in fashion. I always couldn't find the right formula. And then w when this light bulb went up, you know, went up in London, I realized, you know what, this is this is what I, I, I need to start doing. You know, I'd, what I'm doing is also changing the narrative on how cliche and how uh, primitive people look at our culture. As we had spoken earlier on, I feel like it's our calling as Arabs who are westernized or who have been exposed to the West to showcase the beauty and the brilliance of our culture and how rich and how multifaceted Absolutely. it can be, you know? When we come back, we'll look at how Toby became an inflection point for Hatim's career and the launch of Authenticité. That's right after this short break. Welcome back. You're listening to What I Did Next with my guest, Hatem El Hakil. In 2007, Hatem opened his first boutique for Tobes. I participated in uh, Dubai Fashion Week and Sheikh Majid Sabah um, attended my show. And at that time, he had Villa Moda, uh, Dubai, Kuwait and Bahrain. And from the first show, I was very lucky to have a Saudi brand, a uh, traditional brand, uh, alongside Marni, Prada, Dolce Cabana, like This is the kind of narrative that I wanted to create uh, through my fashion to show that. And of that caliber, you were in that caliber, which is what you wanted. Exactly. So, and from there, the rest is history. I opened uh, th two other boutiques in, in Jeddah. I opened one in Riyadh. Um, was very lucky to have been able to dress international celebrities such as, you know, Snoop Dogg to Christian Louboutin. Um, and we also dressed, uh, we were commissioned to do the polo match for Prince William as well. So kind of really took off. I was very lucky to be able to express myself in that way. However, at that time, we always had to go to Dubai to get ourselves recognized. The, the ecosystem, fashion ecosystem wasn't there. We really kind of, you know, had to jump through hoops and we were pretty much on our own, you know. Um, so I was lucky to have had the support of the family to be able to pursue my dream and continue doing my fashion shows and doing my collections. So you you carried on until about 2020, and then COVID hit, and that changed the dynamics both on the ground and also in you, yes. what you wanted to pursue after Toby. So did you officially close it down? Yes. That was That must have been quite sad, though, for you. It was very difficult, but... <laughs> What we have to realize is that uh, we, since we don't have the infrastructure as a designer, uh, when you become a designer like me, who's very emphatic, very, you know, uh, much of a perfectionist, you, the, the end result has to be perfect. And the only way we can guarantee quality is if you have your own manufacturing, you have your own workshop, you have your own uh, sales team, you have... So friend, designer friends of mine who are in New York or in Paris, they create the collection. They go to a workshop, they make a contract, and they create their own prototype. And from there, they're free. You know, they don't have to worry about it. We can, we didn't, we weren't able to do that in those days. Now things are improving. Eventually, inshallah, it will get to that stage. And when you were working, what was the situation, Hatim? How did you, how did you create your line? I had to do everything. I had to find my own tailors. I had to create my own patterns. I had to source my own fabrics. And, and uh, it was uh, quite a process. And at the same time, when the end result was ready, for example, if PT Umo wants to buy a few pieces, I wasn't able to supply because they want 300 pieces. 
how am I going to come up with the 300 pieces with the same quality? I'm not going to go to any random workshop and do that. So for me, if I go back into fashion, if I can guarantee that I can get the quality of the production for 50 pieces or 300 pieces, I, I will go back to it. But uh, that was always a uh, process and an ongoing battle for me. And I felt like, you know what? I'll weigh this one out. Why don't I help other people for change and see? And at the same time, it's actually very rewarding. I'm able now to to create uh, opportunities for communities. I've been doing my own content for the past 20 years where I would do my photo shoots. I would do, uh, and I realized that I really had a passion for that. So why not do that by empowering and bridging local creatives and shedding light on them with international yeah. brands? So this is yeah. how authenticity came about, you know? And I also think it's interesting. I mean, you know, Zaman, our, our parents, grandparents had one career for life. Or they worked at one company for life. And yes. that's not the reality anymore. We don't do that anymore. You know, now people jump from thing to thing or um, uh, they outgrow things or for whatever reason, they they take a different direction. Mm. Um, but yours is obviously complementary to what you had been doing. It's something, as you said, you'd always been doing. It had always been there in the background kind of percolating and then you threw yourself into it. So tell me about authenticity. 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 Yeah. In, in, in Arabic, it's asala. Asala. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Authenticity. Okay. Yeah. So it's French. It's a French pronunciation. I mean, because of my, my, you know, my French education, I always kind of incorporate a bit of, you know, uh, that. Of course. Uh, of course. But uh, the whole point is because I feel like a lot of creatives have been overlooked because they don't have the capital, they don't have the PR. Uh, whereas, uh, so we don't get to sh shine the light on them, you know, because they don't have, they don't have a voice. So for me, I realized that and also it kind of kill, kills the credibility of the market where you only get to see certain people, uh, versus there are so many incredible people that we don't know about, you know? So my mission was always to kind of shed light on the hidden and the shimmering gems of Saudi Arabia. And I think that there's an incredible community of creatives who all they need is one push. And and what do you what is this? Is this an agency or is it a, what is it exactly? So it's a marketing and branding agency, and we also do content. Okay. We do activations. Uh, the ethos is to to ensure that we are authentic in every uh, in the messaging and the selection and the curation of talent that we we curate. We always make sure that we curate people who have a you know, a great storytelling, a great voice, a great way of looking at things differently and sh showing the new Saudi Arabia, showing uh, where Saudi Arabia really is heading. And uh, I'm also part of the fashion society in Saudi Arabia. And of course, I have, uh, you know, our platform on, on social media. Um, we'll get to the podcast as well, which is complimentary. But I feel uh, very proud of the fact that a lot of international brands now are starting to really take uh, our markets much more seriously. So a lot of them have been very supportive, whether it's Harrods, whether it's Valentino, whether it's Boucheron, um, brands that want to enter the market in a different way. And it's no longer one size fits all where um, brands just hire one agency. I think they want a new voice. They want a new perspective. They want to see things from uh, a different box. And this is where we come in. I had interviewed Imran Ahmed from the business of fashion. And at the time, this was last May, uh, and he had just come out with a, um, with a report uh, about the retail environment in the Middle East and how all the big designers used to just focus on Ramadan and produce kaftans and then think that they had provided what the region needed yeah. and call it a day and then go back home. And, you know, that the, the, the report that he came back with was showing a very sophisticated market. But also, interestingly, which I'm sure you have also seen, is a turning away from everything Western and an assumption that everything that comes from the West is best and an acceptance and, an, and, a, and a pride in local Um and melding maybe a bit of this, a bit of that, but but traditional uh, uh, fashion, traditional um, uh, ornaments, jewelry, wh whatever you want to design, traditional design, is having a resurgence now with a younger generation, right? Are you seeing that? How are we even going to have our own identity if our heritage and our culture is not ingrained in what we create 
um, we're, we might as well just, you know, uh, follow what everyone else is doing. And the whole point of exactly. creating your own essence, creating your own culture, creating your own narrative and showcasing what we are about for for us for people to give us attention for people to to uh to start respecting us they have to realize that we're gonna we have our own stories and our own stories have to be reflected in our work uh, that's the rule and that's always been kind of my ethos you know people look at our culture um going towards tradition as primitive actually i i don't i don't agree i think it's very progressive and i think it gives us a stronger sense of identity uh, now a lot of a lot of us are celebrating our identity, and it's giving us even more more strength and more credibility because there is this identity that now we have realized, which is heritage, which is culture, and the way we execute it, the way we showcase it, it's up to us. But the there's so many incredibly well uh, executed concepts, whether it's fashion, whether it's, for example, a brand like Abadia, okay, which which you must follow, Shahad Sahel. Uh, incredible approach towards tradition, very progressive, sustainable fabrics, really beautiful, beautifully executed. It could be uh, in Milan, it could be anywhere. And it's, it, it doesn't stop there. It's, it's, it's an interior design, it's poetry, yeah. it's, it's fashion, it's writing, it's content. Uh, yeah. So many elements that people have to see in our culture, you know. So we work with a lot of uh, also international brands that want to have a different strategy. So it's Across the board, we offer a 360 solution in coming into the market, uh, thinking of how to approach the market marketing-wise, uh, think PR-wise. Also, a kind of we work with major with major PR companies to make sure that they have the right voice for KSA. I mean, I've been doing this for a long time, you know, like yeah. over 20 years. So remember, I started when I was five, you know, so it makes me 25. <laughs> no, and not only that, you're in a unique position because, as you said, you're a bridge. You're a bridge because you obviously know your own culture very well, but Thank you him. also know the West very well, yes, uh, yeah. having been educated in Europe and in the U.S. So you know exactly how they, what is required by them, the level of professionalism that they expect. Exactly. And you're a translator left and right. You're able to explain one side to the other. And I think um, that's what en enables you to do this work. Thank you, and it, it's uh, it, it honestly is uh, an area that I've always wanted to involve myself in because changing perception and uh, elevating uh, the the, the 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 cliches and the narratives that we have, I'm able to translate that in my work. I'm able to not just fashion. Now I can do that through my work with my clients, with my content. So it's and it's amazing to see how much more responsive the uh, the Western brands are and how much more uh, eager and trusting they are now versus before, like two two or three years ago. Which, and, and Absolutely, so the sky's the limit, really. Tell me a little bit about the podcast. It's called Gems of Arabia. We're trying to, to follow your, your, your great footsteps. Um, <laughs> I think we're all following each other. We're all together. <laughs> <laughs> you're very kind. Thank you. Le really love what you're doing as well and the substance that you're providing Thank us. Thank you. So, Thank, Thank you, you so much. Gems of Arabia actually started about six years ago. It was a column that I was writing, even when I was uh, you know, designing. Uh, I always wanted to continue what I'm doing through fashion, but through writing. So really highlight people who inspire me and showing how incredible people are. We, 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 you know, we did uh, Christian Louboutin going to Saudi Arabia, Madain Saleh. And where were the columns, uh, Hatem? Where were you uh, d uh, publishing these? When I first started, it was at uh, with Bureau. Uh, which is a uh -huh. uh, local portal. But then I continued, and, and now uh, they are on my website. I see, I see. So for me, my, my mission was always to showcase uh, how rich our, our culture is. You know, uh, I, I was blessed enough to have the first interview with support with Princess Rima Bandar, who is now who is a, um, a dear friend from... Uh, from ISA, which is a high school that I went to in the U.S., Islamic Saudi Academy. And I went she's there. the Saudi ambassador to Washington. Yes, yeah. So I remember the the first article that we wrote that was when before she started, and she was uh, the messaging that she had in the article was that she hopes to one day see the Saudi women not just uh, 
you know, a dreamer, but it's a success story. And it's amazing how she has manifested it. And look at where it has come and how full circle it has become. And mashallah, where she is now, you know, like an exemplary. Incredible. Exemplary lady for, uh, for for all generations. She's a wonderful role model and an imba- and a, an example for all women, not just Arab Abs- women. All absolutely. women. Absolutely. And for me, in, in when I started, I always wanted. I was always, there's so many people that I was inspired by, and I wanted to write about them. So, um, and it goes on. You know, we have Mashal Shemimri, who's the first uh, Saudi aerospace engineer. Uh, yes. To uh, you know, Hussein Al Rida uh, when he first started, you know, the first Saudi uh, Olympic rower, and, and it goes yes. on, and it goes on, and then from yes. there, from there, it just resonated, and uh, came COVID, uh, and then I said, you know what, I want to start doing this, so I started opening my uh, my first, started filming my first episodes, and the the, uh, the rest is history. You know, I've, mm. it was nice to be able. It's one thing to create content uh, and do videos, but it's another thing to have a deep dive. With key yes. people that that inspire you, where you really get to, you know, uh, connect with with the community in, in in a much more kind of you know personal way. And that's the beauty of podcasts, right, Hatem? Yes. Because you can spend as long as you want talking about specific subjects. You can drill down deep, and you already know that you have people who are going to be interested in that subject. So. You know, you're not going to appeal to everyone, but the people you appeal to, you're going to appeal to very deeply. Absolutely. And across all industries. So we had uh, collaborated with the Saudi Cup, uh, which was, uh, you know, an honor where we we interviewed key people from uh, uh, Prince Bandar al-Faisal to Princess Noor al-Faisal, Dina Abdelaziz, who is our fashion icon. I'm sure she's literally the first Arab woman to go to the, you know, uh, Met Gala's Vanity Fair uh, international parties, like a, a global ambassador for fashion. Uh, we look up to her, and she has also been a force in mm-hmm. fashion. Uh, for example, Prabal Gurug, who is a designer for Claire Danes and Michelle Obama. Yes, very well known. Yeah, told me that yeah. he stocked his first collection at DNA Boutique in Riyadh, which is uh, Princess Dina's uh, boutique. So imagine, you know, like. The, the impact that certain people have. You know, we have also had uh, Farida Khalfe, who is someone who I respect tremendously. Uh, we brought her to Saudi. We had Dafaf Shnifan, who's the first um, uh, Arab uh, supermodel. Yeah. So it's, it doesn't just stop at uh, Saudi. It's Saudi-centric, but we are inclusive of the MENA. We're inclusive to all the, the people who have contributed to the Arabic landscape in a positive way. When we come back, we talk about the root and branch transformation underway in Saudi Arabia and how Hatim sees his legacy. That's after this break. Welcome back. You're listening to my conversation with Hatim Al Akil. I want to talk about Saudi Arabia as a country that is coming in from the cold going into a new phase. You're in the heart of it. As a lot of my listeners know, I grew up in Saudi in the from the mid-70s to the mid-80s in Jeddah, and I went back uh, to Jeddah uh, a year ago and I was lucky enough to attend the Islamic Art Biennale and visit El Ola. And I was blown away by what I saw. Um, I saw a modern country. I saw a very proud country. I saw a country uh, uh, opening up to outsiders, wanting to show their traditions and um, and 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 show their heritage. And I wanted your take on how has it happened, where is it going, and and just your thoughts on it. Well, I have one word, um, MBS. Yeah. <laughs> it is a vision that he has had. Uh, the 2030 vision is paramount and is, has changed all our lives. Uh, all the things that we, we dreamed of are now happening. You know, I remember when I first started designing, you know, imagine if I had that infrastructure, imagine, you know, the, the, the possibilities and the opportunities that, alhamdulillah, I've had the opportunities, but imagine how much more. So he's literally giving all the elements that we dreamed of on a silver platter. And it's not just about the, the vision, it's also about the execution and the planning. And you look at all the, the people that are being hired, ministers, ambassadors, all young, all dynamic, all progressive in their thinking. Uh, it's a math, I mean, this is what it takes, really. It's a question. Yeah. Uh, the vision is also 
clearly has a lot of passion, and clearly there is a lot of passion towards heritage, towards culture. And uh, look at any country now, and look at the country that really is synonymous with heritage and celebrating its culture is Saudi Arabia. You know, we we, we uh, utilize all the the elements of heritage in all our communication. You know, I, I think it's also very interesting that after. Uh, the Khashoggi um, uh, killing um, when MBS was uh, shunned for a few years, um, how he has now been completely in, embraced and part of the landscape and uh, every consultant is flocking to Saudi Arabia to work on all these mega projects, Neom, uh, El Ola, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, all the uh, you know Biden, um, the 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 United Kingdom, everyone is is coming back and has embraced Saudi again as if that incident never happened, um, and and I find it interesting. Uh, is it possibly because the world economy is not doing so well and they realize they can't be uh, the 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 schoolmaster telling Saudi. No, you're, you cannot be included. You will stay on the side. They realize they have to embrace Saudi. Saudi is a very important market, very important country. And they have to accept that this is a reality and that they, you know, they have to deal with him now. I mean, I think that the, the vision is definitely what uh, people are starting to see now, you know, whether it's... Uh, Art, with, like we had discussed, whether it's fashion, whether it's the evolution of so many incredible women who are at the forefront uh, in positions, uh, leading and uh, showing the way, you know. Uh, the media always likes to exaggerate things, unfortunately, you know, uh, but it's come to a point now where social media has made the world a lot smaller and yes. people, are not, people are not dumb or deaf anymore and they can Absolutely. see the beauty of the culture, the beauty of the yeah. community, the uh, how genuine we are about uh, how we feel and how over the years we have been, not been able to express ourselves. So everyone is able to kind of fl flourish and, and show who they are and show what they're about, you know? And I think also if we look at it in a bigger picture, the geopolitical aspect, uh, with this war in Gaza, I think because masks have fallen um, and wherever you sit in the world, no one is above anyone else. And I think for a very long time, there was that feeling of um, the West looking down at a lot of uh, countries in the Middle East and, yeah. and elsewhere in Africa and so on. And and that's, that can't be the case anymore. And I think what we're seeing is we're seeing not just a realignment of certain countries, but we're seeing we're in a transition phase, I think, where some countries are rising and rising very uh, powerfully. And um, and I think Saudi is one of them. Um, I think Saudi is going to be, uh, you know, how Egypt had been the leader of the Middle East for a very long time in terms of culture, in terms of uh, power, uh, wealth, etc., I think that role is now being ceded to Saudi. You know, it's been a long time coming, but I think it is happening. Um, and and I think it's interesting to see to be to be here now and watch it happen. I think as an observer is a very interesting thing to be to be watching. Uh, and I'm sure you're you're feeling it too where you are. I mean, we can't tell you how how thrilled we are to see the progress happening. And especially um, now you have incredible, uh, very dynamic uh, younger generation, you know, that is also given the opportunity to kind of showcase their, their creativity, their work, uh, the sites, the gems that we have, the history that we have, discovering, you know, uh, from Al-Ula and going back and yeah. even deeper. And then also, let's not forget that we're also, the, the, you know, we have Mecca and Medina, which are uh, major, very important sites that, that articulate also the, the, the balance that we have between being still holding on to our tradition, still holding on to, the, to our roots, but also moving forward. And that's what people have to realize is that uh, we need to also uh, respect our values, respect our traditions. And uh, it's only a question of people, again, saying, looking at us as we're not, we're no longer seen as primitive uh, on the contrary, we're seen as more dynamic and we're seen as more progressive because we are able to hold on to our traditions, hold on to our heritage and still move forward. 
I don't know why people, you know, modernity means West. You know, it doesn't necessarily yeah. have to be that. No, absolutely. Uh, Western culture. You can do the two. Yeah, I absolutely. can do the two. And, and, and you know, uh, Western culture has been has has really kind of inspired me over the years. I've learned a lot. I'm, I'm grateful to Western culture. But now it's time to also focus on our own culture and, as I mentioned, on, on on our identity. And I believe that this is also what Saudi Arabia is doing, tapping into what is their identity and taking it further. If you were to look back um, at what you've done so far, what do you think, what for you is is the most important aspect of what you've done so far? What do you want to be remembered for? Um, what do you feel you'll, you know, you'll leave behind, so to speak? Someone who made a, a difference uh, showing the, the culture in a different light. Um, someone who has given opportunity uh, to the creative community. Um, someone who is who has uh, hopefully a good son, someone who is a, a good brother, a good friend. Um, because in the end of the day, when you go, you you take your good deeds with you. So we should be involved. That's all in you work. take with you. Yes. Nothing else. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You're exactly. right, and that's what matters. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I hope to one day kind of uh, be able to do something uh, more, even for the community that I'm I'm working with. And uh, I feel like, uh, although I'll always be a designer at heart, uh, what I'm doing now, being able to, to reach out to communities and empower them, is has been much more rewarding. So I hope that the community will will appreciate uh, and see, see my vision, you know, uh, when I'm gone. And and do you feel that you have another turning point in you coming up? Or do you feel that this is the path you're, you're, you're happy to continue on for now? I haven't even started my, my checklist. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. I haven't even started. There's a lot that I want to uh, accomplish ac- across the board, um, whether it's, it's film, whether it's fashion, whether... Even fashion, you know, even um, creating uh, an infrastructure and ecosystem that's even more pronounced uh, for the creative community. And people don't keep forgetting the creative community is not just artists. And you have entrepreneurs, you have poets, you have so many people that are incredible that need to have a voice. And uh, we've been able to do that professionally. You know, so uh, inshallah, I hope to continue doing that. Have you considered just uh, as a as something that just I thought of now? Have you considered of putting together some kind of creative summit in Saudi and inviting people from the region, not just from within? Is that something you're considering to do? That's a great idea, actually. <laughs> yeah, let's talk. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Hasim, thank you so much. This was amazing. Thank you. It's my. It's really a pleasure. And thank you for giving me this opportunity. And uh, I'm honored to be part of your podcast. Thank you. That was my episode with designer Hatem El Akil, founder of Authenticity and host of the Gems of Arabia podcast. Hatem is a three-time winner of the Esquire Awards for Best Regional Designer. If you're a member of the show, you'll get a bonus episode with Hatim next week where we talk about how he began supporting the creative community in Saudi Arabia and his diverse cultural life. You can also find extended clips from our episodes on YouTube and connect with us on Instagram X and on LinkedIn. Just search for What I Did Next. Thank you for joining me today. You've been listening to What I Did Next from ANT Media. I'm Malak Fuad and the show is produced by Shirag Desai. See you again in a couple of weeks.